Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Alyssa Young, and I'm the audience and events producer at the Bangor Daily News. For those of you in the audience tonight who are subscribers, thank you so much for your support. We'd like to welcome all of you who may be joining in on our BDN events online meetups for the first time. If local journalism is important to you, please purchase a subscription to the Bangor Daily News. We'd also like to thank our broadband and main series sponsors, GWI and Island Institute, as well as AARP Maine. And our tourmaline, tourmaline sponsor for this event is Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. As a reminder, this event is being recorded. Our host tonight is BDN editorial page editor, Susan Young. Susan has also worked as the news editor and reporter for the BDN. If you have any questions for any of our speakers, please use the chat function to send them in and I'll pose them on your behalf. We have a fantastic group of people joining us tonight, this evening. Nick Batista, hello Nick, is the senior policy director at the Island Institute. Nick has been collaborating on their broadband for coastal sustainability projects since 2016. Nick also serves on the boards of the Maine Broadband Coalition and Maine Island Trail Association. A native Mainer, Nick graduated from Colby College. He then obtained his MS in Marine Affairs from the University of Rhode Island and JD from Roger Williams University. Kendra Dro Grindle, hello Kendra, is the Senior Community Development Officer at the Island Institute. Kendra Dro serves as both the strategic lead and project lead for the Island Institute's broadband team as they work to achieve national average connectivity for all island and coastal communities in Maine. Kendra Jo first came to Maine as an Island Fellow on Islesboro in 2013 and following her fellowship worked for the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association as the Community Programs and Operations Manager. She holds a BA in Human Development and Family Studies with a concentration in rural families from the University of Connecticut. Jaffet Ells, hello Jaffet, <laughs> is AARP Maine's Outreach and Advocacy Director. Jaffet began his tenure with AARP Maine in 2014 and brings more than 10 years of experience in grassroots cam campaigns and communications to the position. In 2020, he wrote and co-managed the targeted AARP Maine campaign strategy in support of the Yes on One broadband referendum that passed in July with more than 75% of the vote. Charlie Woodworth, hello Charlie is the Executive Director of Franklin County's Economic and Community Development Office. His grassroots team of community leaders recognizes that access to reliable high-speed broadband is the keystone to achieving economic and community prosperity for the region. They have been working on planning and implementation for the past four years and currently have 10 towns working on implementation. And on that note, I will hand it over to Susan to begin the discussion. I hope everyone enjoys the event and don't forget to register for the three other upcoming events in our broadband in Maine series. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alyssa. I'm Susan Young. I'm the editorial page editor at the Bangor Daily News. And I wanna thank all of our audience members, particularly our subscribers for joining us tonight. I think we're gonna have a really good discussion about broadband and what comes next in Maine. I also want to thank our panelists for their time and expertise um, as we begin this discussion. So I'm going to start with um, just really quick, if everyone could just say what their organization's role is in terms of the state's broadband infrastructure and um, the build out that will begin with the bond issue. And then we'll start our discussion. So if you want to go first, Nick. Sure, Nick Batista, I'm with the Island Institute, but tonight I'm here as chair of the Connect Maine Authority Board, which is the statewide broadband authority. It's a quasi-governmental agency with seven um, volunteer board members, a staff of two, and a small budget compared to the challenge that Maine's broadband challenge is. Thanks. And Kendra? Hi, everyone. I'm Kendra O'Grindle. I work with the Island Institute. Um, we're based in Rockland. We've been working on broadband since 2015, and I've been in this capacity for a little over two years. We um, have a community-driven broadband process that we've supported um, over 80 communities along the coast and islands of Maine in starting to begin planning and having those conversations to bring community engagement into the conversation around 
lack of access or, um, or inadequate access and reliability. We support the Connect Main Authority through Nick's position as well as the Maine Broadband Coalition um, at multiple levels in, in, that, um, uh, in that coalition as well. So really seeing a statewide solution to our region's problems. Thank you, and Charlie. So we're in Franklin County and the Franklin County demographics are telling. Um, we have a shrinking and aging population. So as the Economic and Com Community Development Office for our region, we're spearheading our broadband effort on a countywide basis, including all communities. If one town gets it, that's good, but it's not good enough. We have 22 towns, 14 townships for 32 communities. And so uh, through extensive community outreach, we've convinced every town, each and every uh, town to contribute to the cost of a countywide plan. And we did that in 2017. Uh, but as a result of repeated outreach and selectman meetings, um, the towns understand the opportunity and they're engaged. They also understand that uh, they need to share in the investment of infrastructure. Uh, the inter the uh, ISPs, the providers, they're not bad people. They just need to stay in business. And so they need to be able to get a return on their investment. And understanding that for us um, is, is essential. Uh, it's a public-private partnership will be the solution. Uh, so the study we did, it measured who's connected, who's not, and at what speeds, and high level cost to get everyone connected to reliable high-speed internet. So our goal is to have our data attract providers with their solutions. And a good model for the rest of the state that I think we'll talk about tonight. Thanks, and Jafet. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jafet Ells. Um, and many people question why AARP is at this table. Um, and I think we are relatively new to the broadband table, but um, we came in pretty hard and made um, the referendum in July a priority for our community engagement and grassroots work. We see broadband as the first issue, uh, and I think COVID-19 has made that very clear, whether you're an educator, whether you're in healthcare or a patient, uh, or whether you're just somebody who stays connected to your community, uh, now having that broadband connection is a requirement. And AARP began seeing this as more and more of our services uh, have begun shifting to a digital uh, playing field. Uh, it's becoming more and more difficult to do things offline, things that we've done for decades and generations. And so having that broadband connection is now a requirement um, for many folks and having that option. We're not just looking at the accessibility, we're looking at the affordability, because often um, not just having access is the, is the question, is whether um, older Mainers can afford some of the bills that we see coming across the table for a broadband connection. So we are happy to be here and really happy to be uh, making broadband expansion in Maine a focus um, as we are the oldest state in the country and we should be leading the way on something like this. Great, thank you. And Nick, I'm gonna turn it back to you. If you can just quickly kind of give us a real brief history lesson, you know, where has Maine been? Um, how did we get to the point that we're at? And I hope you can um, hit on just a couple of quick things. You know, be helpful to know what is broadband? What are we talking about? And another question we hear so often from people is why is it taking so long to build out the system that we need? So with those two questions in mind, I'll turn it over to you. Sure, thank you. So um, what is broadband? Broadband is high-speed internet access that lets you do things like this. It lets you um, meet virtually. And if we started sharing more information than just our, our video, um, some of you might quickly run into trouble. I know some of you on the call um, struggle with, with Zoom meetings. I recognize some of the names and um, have seen your, your shaky connections. We, we know that over the last probably decade or so, internet has shifted from being a, a luxury to and something that's nice to have to something much more essential. Um, it's essential for government functions. It's essential for meeting people like this. It's, it's been essential um, in our daily lives through, through the current pandemic. Um, over the last decade or so, communities have started to realize that they could play a role in solving their broadband challenges and take control of their future. 
Um, it's an important part of Maine's story that we'll come back to. You'll, you heard Charlie mention it a little bit. We'll, we'll come back to it a little bit later. Um, the federal government provides some uh, subsidies to large companies in exchange for providing a basic level of internet service over phone lines. That worked well in some places for some people, but I think many Mainers are um, feeling left behind and their needs weren't met, aren't being able to be met by existing, existing systems. It's a growing realization that wires meant to transmit voice aren't great conduits um, for the speed and volume of data that we need to move today. Systems meant to carry data perform much better and much more reliably for carrying data than systems meant for, for carrying voice. Um, those services meant for voice typically degrade by distance and the number of people um, using them as well. And that means they're much less useful when it comes to economic development or telehealth or any of the other things that we've realized are, are absolutely critical for access, accessing the internet. Um, broadband's place-based infrastructure, this goes a little bit to, to why it's taking so long to, um, to solve the broadband challenges for the state. It's built street by street, utility pole by utility pole. You have wires hanging on the utility poles out in front of your, your house and some of those might carry your, your internet. Um, your neighbor two streets over might have better service than you do. Your neighbor 10 streets down the road might have worse service. Your ability to have a good internet connection depends on a company seeing the business case for making a capital investment or being willing to receive some sort of subsidy. For a company to invest the capital, they have to make a good return on it. This is what, what Charlie was starting to talk a little bit about. One of those, I'm thinking about a back of the envelope calculation, $40,000 a mile is a reasonable assumption for what it costs to build a new fiber network. Um, the number of potential customers that mile of infrastructure passes, as well as how many of them actually subscribe to the service, um, that matters greatly when it comes to calculating the potential return on investment for, for that private capital. Broadband's not a regulated industry. Nobody has to provide you service. Um, as important as broadband is, that's a really key, key point. Um, nobody has to provide you broadband service. It's fundamentally a private marketplace. Um, it's not public, it's not regulated like electricity or phones. Um, and state and federal subsidies are reserved for areas that have worse internet service than what I had growing up in Falmouth in the late 90s. Um, so, you know, not, not everybody gets, is going to be able to get a, a state subsidy and, and those who do are, are really um, behind where a lot of the rest of the state is. State leadership was conspicuously absent in the broadband space until a few years ago, and the funding has continued to, to trail that. Um, in the absence of state leadership, communities have taken it upon themselves to understand their broadband challenges, um, understand what they're facing, and what they could do to try to work towards solving them. Some communities did this work on their own. Some communities came together, like Franklin County, to do this work as a group. Um, and you know, I recognize a number of the names on, on the phone here. You've been working on this for a while, uh, whether you're in Long Island, Maine or Southport or Belfast, you, you all have broadband challenges that you've been working really hard at the community level because it's really important to your community. Community planning serves a couple of functions. It's good to think of it like sticky tape um, for attracting private investment um, and also laying the groundwork for a municipal subsidy. The rural character of our communities isn't really something that we can easily change to make a broadband investment more attractive, but through community planning can change the underlying economics of a broadband project by changing the number of people who are likely to take service and by reducing the private capital um, outlay necessary to build a project. Some communities in Maine have taken this a step further and realized that over the long term, these projects do generate a little bit of revenue and the community um, funding may go further if the community decides to actually own the infrastructure instead of relying on a private company to own the, own the infrastructure. In these communities, the private sector typically provides the service over that publicly owned infrastructure. And so that's a very brief history of where we've been, I think. I appreciated it. Um, and I want, um, Kendra Joe, I'd like to bring you in because when we were planning this event, you talked about how Maine was a leader 
in broadband planning, but then we fell behind because of a lack of funding and other um, issues. So I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about that and you know what hope there is for Maine to catch up again. Sure. So yeah, I mean we've been at conferences that have highlighted Maine as you know some of the as one of the top states in the country when it comes to broadband planning, when it comes to communities prioritizing it, starting to talk within their own communities to each other, to the state, to their delegation about the issues of, of connectivity and how it really is. It's, it's changed so much over the last 10, 20 years. We are not the same consumers of the internet that we were five years ago or even two years ago. We are much more producers now than we are just consumers. And so when it comes to communities, and I think Maine, one of the unique things is that Maine is a home rule state. So things really do start at a community level here, unlike in a lot of Midwest states, um, Southern states that really look to a county level or to the state to kind of top down, talk about what the priorities are. So the Island Institute has had a community driven broadband process model that a lot of communities have looked to. It's helped inform some things at the state and um, some core partners throughout the state, Maine Community Foundation, Connect Maine, um, as, as well as our organization have provided planning grant funding for a number of years to give that little bit of a, a boost to communities that are starting out, break down some of the barriers of cost when it comes to hiring a consultant or, or doing it on their own to do gap analysis. So really seeing where there are unserved areas where people are experiencing less than the FCC and state standard of 25 megabits download and three megabits per second upload. Um, and then starting to collect those stories, survey, and just understand what their possibilities are, not just with the providers that are already in their community, those incumbent providers, but also non-incumbent providers. We have small internet service providers throughout the state um, that are not always your incumbent provider, but are looking to expand, are looking to bring in new technologies, um, are, are looking to partner with communities. And we also have larger companies as well that are looking to you know, partner with communities and, and fill in those gaps that they've, um, that have been placed there over a number of years. So when it has, when it's come to these conversations, a lot of states have looked to Maine to model um, after communities that have taken those first steps forward to model after um, community engagement process um, and that's been really amazing. And there's a lot of states or a lot of communities that are ready. They've been waiting. And this bond that just passed last year was the kind of the first time we saw the state really recognize um, a larger amount of money needed at the state level to leverage funds, to leverage these projects and to see them through. In the past, seeing hundreds of thousands of dollars available for communities that have been planning and ready it doesn't really get a lot of projects moving forward. It doesn't get whole projects off the ground, but to see $15 million, it's still small compared to the large scale problem and small compared to some other states who are you know, dedicating 70 million, 100 million um, over the course of, uh, of a year or two to community driven projects and, and community level projects. Um, but what we're seeing now is that there are communities that have been planning over the last three or four years that have shovel ready projects that are ready to go and are waiting to see where this $15 million can really take them. Not just town projects, but regional projects like Charlie mentioned in Franklin County, that that, that scale is so large that a couple of hundred thousand dollars really wouldn't have seen it all the way through. But now being able to look at millions of dollars is, is you know just something that can get more, we can go farther. It can go a lot farther for the state, but it's still not enough. And we'll talk more about that throughout this. Okay, so I think that's a perfect jumping off point for Charlie as we talk about um, what communities have done and how communities have stepped in to begin building their own broadband systems and get residents what they need. I wonder if you could talk about quickly how your project came together and you know how it's going what advice you would give to other communities that want to undertake something similar? Okay. Um, so it was it was started as grassroots, just some citizen leaders understanding what's holding us back and. Uh, 
the outreach and hearing the same thing. So the common denominator was you know, shrinking population. How do we keep our youth here? How do we, we're so lucky to have uh, good high schools. We have the University of Maine at Farmington here. How do we um, incentivize or stimulate those graduates to wanna to stay here and find uh, careers? So, and then we have our aging population. So because it was grassroots, we had, um, we had uh, advocates in every town pushing this you know, forward, pushing the conversation forward. And the key is um, not, uh, it's, it's let's discuss, let's talk about it and come to understand the opportunities. Uh, because if the towns aren't engaged, my organization just can't show up and attract the, uh, the funding for the planning and, and work and, or anything like that. If we come in and do it for everybody, will fall flat on our face. There's no engagement. And so we learned early on this, we need to have the grassroots connection into the communities and get them to talk amongst themselves about the opportunity. So, so that's how it started. And I think that's the, you know, Nick said stickiness, but that's what's kept everyone engaged and, and leaning in on this process. So we've been at it for four years. My goodness, is this frustratingly slow. Um, and it just comes down to money, that's all. So what do we do about that? Why do we need all this money? And, and Kendra talked about uh, the rural nature, but just an example of um, trying to highlight the challenges of rural Maine. So on the coast where there's more density, uh, southern part of the state, there's enough people, the providers can get a return on their investment, but here, um, for some clarity, uh, Franklin County's percentage of unserved population. So our county study done in 2017, 2018, so it's a little old, but still it's, it's, it's relevant. Um, that shows that 40% of our road miles are unserved. So these are road, these are road miles out in the country. 22% of our population lives along those roads. That's 7,300 residents. So why talk about road miles? Road miles illustrate the cost of infrastructure. There's an expense to attach your equipment to each pole. 33 poles a mile begins to add up. So that cost is a significant barrier. Um, and that's why the providers are, are not, they're, they're staying away unless there's a data showing them the possible uh, business they could get, and unless the towns recognize they need to partner in this investment. So I hope that illustrates that why the cost is what it is and uh, the hurdle that that creates. Yeah, I want to talk a lot more about um, the towns and why this is being done at the town level. But at this point, I want to bring JFIT into the conversation. And if we could talk about equity, I mean, it seems that we have a very piecemeal approach to doing this in Maine. It is kind of community by community. And I think that raises concerns about equity and who might get left behind. And I think that's something that AARP and obviously other groups have been concerned about. Yeah, thank you. Um, equity is our number one concern when it comes to broadband connectivity, especially for older Mainers. And I think as everybody knows, um, we have an older population, we have an even more rural older population. And so many of the people that we're talking about trying to get connected um, are older and simply don't even have the, the opportunity to plug in um, to a modern broadband connection and all the services, um, community connections, friends and family that go with that connection. Um, so that's probably why you know, you're seeing us pop up a lot more when we're talking about that connectivity issue. I think like it has for everybody, COVID-19 has really sort of put this front and center. Um, isolation, social isolation is a huge issue um, in the aging community, notwithstanding a global pandemic. And uh, we have seen a dramatic increase in the number of our, just our volunteers and our members across the state, of which there are more than 200,000 
who have uh, sort of been pushed to snap up technology where, where they can to get connected um, during all of this. There are even more who are left behind, you know, who are left behind and are not being uh, able to, to get that connection, whether it's an issue of, uh, you know, internet speed to their house um, or an issue like we have many members who have used public libraries as their main source. Those aren't always an option right now. Um, or if it's an issue of just a technology um, issue, but we have seen many, many more members um, trying to get those devices and those tools. Uh, and I saw Susan Corbett hop on the call and she's done an amazing job of trying to put um, devices in the hands of Mainers all over the state so that they can get connected um, during this time. And so I think it's, a, you know, it's not just about social isolation, it's also about healthcare. Telehealth has been exploding during COVID-19, um, but we have so many rural older Mainers who simply just don't have that ability. They don't have that option. Um, and when you're talking about having to uh, put somebody who might be high risk in a COVID environment, into a car to drive half an hour to uh, a checkup um, when they could be doing that over a broadband connection from their kitchen table to have a conversation with their doctor. It just seems like a no brainer. Um, and so I think the reason AARP is at this table and the reason we are concerned is because it does come down to equity. Um, and it does come down to you know, equity with healthcare, with education, with access to the information you need. And I think point blank, we're seeing that play out in how the vaccine um, is unfolding. Uh, the vaccine rollout uh, up until very recently, you had to have an internet connection in order to respond and get your spot. And we had many members who were calling us and saying, I don't have that ability. How do I get in line? I'm 75. I have pre-existing conditions. I check all the boxes for being high risk. I should be in that line, but I can't get online to get that uh, vaccine appointment. Um, that should not be happening. Um, and if we had better connections, more access that, uh, that were, was affordable as well, that would not be happening the way it is. So it does come down to equity. And I think that example with the pandemic right now and the vaccine rollout points exactly to it. Yeah, so Nick, um, you don't have a magic wand, but as chair of the Connect Main Authority, um, you know, you've heard these concerns. Um, what are, is your organization and what should the state do more of to ensure that the broadband expansion is smoother, that it's not, um, obviously communities that are well organized are probably going to be at the front of the line, but what do we do to try and bring everybody along? We have questions, you know, why isn't this a public utility? Why isn't the federal government doing more? I think there's a lot of concern that this piecemeal approach is going to leave people behind. So I wonder um, if you could talk a little bit about that. And I think we can wrap in, you know, the 15 million as that's allocated. How does that begin to address some of these concerns? Yeah, yeah. I mean, these this is broadband in Maine right now. We have a system that is leading us towards a relatively fractured approach to building up broadband. The Connect Maine Authority has an annual budget of, you know, two to three million dollars a year. That's not enough to to solve this problem. Um, the fifteen million dollar bond that just passed was the first time the state has put any kind of serious money into broadband infrastructure um, ever. And this is this is the first sort of real investment. This is the first time that communities. Um, Charlie's communities, other communities on the call have had an opportunity to have the state be an active partner in helping them with, with their projects. And so I think, I think that's, that's part of the answer is that, you know, the bond has clearly showed how critical broadband is to, to Maine. 75% of voters voted for it. It's over 230,000 Mainers said yes to borrowing $15 million to, um, to bring you better internet. But we got a lot more to do. It's a, um, saw some estimates early, early on in the pandemic, there were, you know, 50, 60, $70 million worth of shovel ready projects, you know, projects that are ready to go, they're planned, providers would start building them tomorrow if the state would put in some match. Um, and those are projects that, you know, have been sitting around for a while. Charlie's got a, a, a bunch of them up in, up in Franklin County, but they're, they're spread out around the state. Um, the state, you know, if the, 
if we want to solve this problem, we have to first say what's the state's role in solving the problem, and what's the state role in funding that funding that solution. Um, and that's really important. We're talking tens, hundreds of millions of dollars in, in funding that's needed. Um, the long-term benefit of that funding is also un, undeniable. Um, you know, I see lots of lots of questions in the chat about other other technologies and why why the conversation heads towards fiber pretty regularly. The Connect Main Authority um, is technology neutral. What the state cares about in, in broadband is what the benefits are, not the technology that's providing it. Um, but the technology that provides the service that's needed over the long term typically is fiber. That's what the applications that are coming into the Connect Main Authority are for. That's what people like Don Fwelling from Pioneer Broadband, who's who's on here, or um, Bill Varney from Premium Choice. That's what they're building in rural Maine. They're building fiber networks in places that doesn't make a lot of business sense to uh, be doing that unsubsidized. And they're doing it because building a fiber network there is the right choice for their business, uh, particularly if they can get a subsidy. So, um, you know, so what are we going to do with the $15 million? You know, how is that going to be distributed if communities and different organizations want to apply? What do they do? Yeah, so Connect Maine has a board meeting next Thursday, and I see some of my fellow Connect Maine board members on the call here. Um, and one of the agenda items on Thursday is opening up a grant round. Um, for use of, of the bond funds. So probably not the whole whole chunk of bond funds, but putting part of it out. Over the last few months, Connect Maine has been developing a um, two different tracks for a competitive grant for broadband. And those tracks recognize the different broadband needs in the state. Um, and so one track is meant to help providers expand their network to the next street or the next neighborhood um, these are applications that Connect Main scoring criteria has historically disadvantaged. Um, the other track is designed to support communities who've been going through the community planning process, um, whether funded with a Connect Main planning grant or funded, funded elsewhere. Um, both of the tracks score the same kinds of things, the size of the project, the Connect Main dollars um, per premise passed, the improvement in speed, how much funding is coming in as match, um, the community support, a few other things, um, but because the tracks are trying to accomplish different things, they they weight those a little bit differently. Um, the applications will be available on the Connect Main website. If you're interested, you can go check it out. Um, remember, these are funds that need to go to be used in unserved areas, and Connect Main has a new process for doing that. Um, I know the Connect Main staff, Peggy's on the on the call here, and um, I'm sure anybody is happy to, to talk with folks about the unserved areas and how to make sure that your communities are, are in it either in this round or for, for future rounds of funding. Um, and there's a whole bunch of nonprofits um, like the Island Institute, people like Charlie, um, groups like the Maine Broadband Coalition, um, consultants, internet service providers, all who are pretty familiar with Connect Maine and Connect Maine's processes and um, available and interested in helping communities to apply for these funds. So, you know, we're going to get to audience questions um, really quickly, but wanted to um, ask about the future. We're going to talk more about where we are now, but um, and you mentioned more funding and um, Charlie, Jafet, Kendra, Joe, please feel free to jump in. You know, we, this is just a a start, the 15 million, we know we need a lot more. So are there efforts for future bond issues? I know there's some bills in the legislature and something I'm curious about and a lot of our audience members are as well. You know, why invest so much in broadband when there might be new technologies that come along that are better, less expensive, better to distribute across the state. So I know that's three things and short amount of time, but I'm going to throw that open to all of you guys. I, I would just start with, you know, more funding, more funding, more funding. Um, supporting a bond at the legislature is probably the most important thing that can happen right now for getting, um, for helping Maine solve our broadband challenges. At the same time, there was a, a question earlier about EC Fiber in, in Vermont, New Hampshire. 
Um, and it's worth noting that a group of community members in Georgetown got together and said, we're, we're tired of trying to get federal money. We're tired of waiting for the state to, to come through with money that's helpful. We're tired of, um, you know, we, we hope the town comes with us, but we, we need to solve this problem now, not in three years. That group's investing their own money in building out a dark fiber network to secure the future of, of their community. And that's, um, that's effectively the, the EC fiber, fiber model. Um, other communities are, are looking at um, similar, similar models. I, I think that is in part the hope for the future of Maine is that, um, that it's not just state funding, it is, it is private citizens, it's other folks um, building that capital stack to, to make these projects happen. Um, and I, on the technology front, I would just say, you know, everybody worries about the next technology for delivering internet. I, I worry deeply that we're not thinking enough about how much technology is currently being connected to the internet in our homes, from our, our phones, from our computers, how fast that's changing and what are the needs going to be next year or two years um, in terms of the technology that all of us need to have. The internet access will, will be or what we'll need to have for internet access. And, and so you know, it's, we can worry about technology for delivering internet or we can worry about is the internet that we have able to meet the needs that we have today and into the future and so. so Charlie, I think you wanted to jump in. I believe there's consensus in the industry that the most stable connection or implementation is on the pole. You know, we do have Starlink out there and we're all waiting with bated breath to see if it can deliver. Um, as big and as powerful as that is, it will be a drop in the bucket for the demand that is out there for rural connectivity. And that's across the globe. So I wanna see it happen, but really there's nothing more stable than being connected to the pole. Um, if you have satellite TV or satellite internet, um, you are uh, at the mercy of the weather and a, a few other variables. So um, that's my position on the, uh, or some thoughts on Starlink versus working with fiber on the pole. Uh, but to give an example of the funding required for out there, that's out there, so our county plan, we figured high level cost to connect every resident in Franklin County at $73 million. So that's just one of 16 counties. And I think for the state, I don't know if the estimate has been 600 million. Um, so we have 15 million to work with. And I think for the state, um, if we have success leveraging those dollars, 15 million, what is a, an appropriate match so that you can maximize your return on an investment. And is it a one to one? You put in a dollar, you get another dollar in your project. Is it five to one? Is it 10 to one? Um, we need these, you know, for the $15 million to, to uh, it is a start, but to, to be impactful, we need to leverage those funds as uh, aggressively as possible. And if we have success with that, we will have success attracting the attention of federal funds, the private funds that Nick talks about. Um, that success will build on success. You know, they'll see that we have uh, projects of merit uh, and we execute and deliver. And that's really, that's on us. So my two cents. <laughs> Thank you. Alyssa, were you gonna um, start asking some of the audience questions? Sure, yeah, there is a question here um, that kind of goes towards what Charlie was just talking about. Todd posed the question, our town is currently in an RFP process for improving broadband. We have some interesting proposals, but some of them are expensive. Are there any grants or other funding opportunities on the horizon that will help reduce the cost and make the proposals more likely to pass when it goes to a vote? Um, I know it's a little bit repetitive, but I think you know, backing that up again might be nice. Anybody? 
<laughs> I think it depends on what the RFP is for. So if the RFP is for a consultant for a feasibility study for engineering designs, you know, part of the planning process, the Connect Main Authority has two phase grant planning grants um, that are available at various times throughout the year. Maine Community Foundation um, has some grants as well. I believe they open in the um, late spring, early summer. Um, and if you're a coastal community or an island community, the Island Institute has planning grants as well. If they are instead for full builds, then you're looking at infrastructure and, you know, I think following what's happening at the state, preparing for grant rounds if you're not ready for now watching what goes on this year with those grant rounds and looking at the scoring criteria, popping into Connect Main Authority meetings and understanding, you know, what is getting scored, what are the other projects out there, and then preparing yours to move forward as well. So there are funds we're seeing more, you know, as broadband becomes more and more of uh, an issue in the forefront, um, we're seeing uh, philanthropic dollars, you know, come behind that as well. So we as an organization get asked, um, as well as the Maine Broadband Coalition, you know, where can foundations um, or other funders kind of put their money? Where can state and federal grants um, shift to go? How can we inform those as well? So there is some funding out there. I would just suggest that you connect with the Maine Broadband Coalition or Maine West Island Institute, some of the um, Connect Maine Authority, some of the partners here on the call, and we can at least give you a little more insight into maybe how, how to offset some of those costs. Thanks, Kendra Jo. Uh, we had a few questions um, about speed definitions. Uh, Bob O'Connor is saying 25 over three is too slow. <laughs> he mentioned the best model is the gig up down. That's a thousand over a thousand that, I, <clears throat> excuse me, Islesboro set up fiber to every house and a cost to each connection of $35 a month. Do you, have any insight into that or the speed connections and what the definitions are behind that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important to say that 25.3 is the level below which you can get a state subsidy right now or you can get a federal subsidy um, for building infrastructure. It's not saying that 25.3 is adequate or okay or the right definition for broadband. It's just saying that's that right now is where the the subsidy starts to kick in. Connect Main Authority has the ability to change that um, based on a set of criteria that's in in Connect Main's rule, um, and that's certainly, I think, an active conversation. Um, but what I think you're you're really getting at is what is the build to standard, and what should public money be going to build to? Um, and how do we make sure that the networks that are built with public money, whether they're state dollars or federal dollars, I, I see some uh, staff from the congressional delegation on, on the call here too. Um, we should be making sure that if we're borrowing money for 10 or 20 years uh, to build the, this infrastructure, that it will meet our needs for that long. And so, yeah, the, the kind of infrastructure that would provide that level of service is what we should be talking about. Just while we're on the issue of speed, I mean, we've got Peggy Schaefer from the Main Broadband Coalition and with a good reminder, and I think we can send this link to everybody. It's um, after the call um, to take the state speed, speed test because we need better data so we know where the areas of most need are. And to your point, Nick, it, hopefully will also help with funding, identifying, you know, what speeds um, different communities have. So um, if you can, please take the speed test um, through the Maine Broadband Coalition, because it's important for your knowledge, but also for them to, when you get the results, it immediately goes to the coalition. So they'll have that information as well. And we can have a better sense of what the picture is across the state in terms of broadband avail availability and speed. Can I add to that, Susan? Yes, please. I would just say, take it more than once. Take it at different times of the day. Take it at, on different days of the week. Your speed fluctuates, you know, and we want to know what your user experience is. We want to know what your getting on the other side of your screen and what you're seeing in the morning, in the afternoon, late at night. 
on Monday, on Wednesday, in the off season, in the summer. Um, this will be up for at least a full year. So looking at September, late September of this year. Um, so for communities that have a lot of seasonal homes and that have reached out and said, well, what about all the homes that are empty right now? How do we test those feeds? We'll, we'll keep bugging, don't worry. We'll keep it going out and we'll keep asking for it, especially when we start to see more people come back into the state, hopefully this you know, late spring and summer. And that data, you know, it's feeding into Maine Broadband Coalition, it's feeding into the Connect Maine Authority, um, our, legis our legislature is looking at it, communities are looking at it. So you're not just informing state entities, you're also informing the broadband committees in your town, municipal officials who are wondering what people are experiencing. Um, we've had communities take surveys for a number of years and that data just set within their committee. This is a way to get it on one map going to one source and looking at the state as a whole when it comes to broadband user experience. So um, I, I can't encourage you enough to take that um, test. And you know it, it helps off, we know data in broadband at both the state and federal level isn't great. Um, we hear it all the time from communities. I was looking at maps today and was frustrated by, by them as well. This is just one additional piece of data that we can work with to understand what's going on when it comes to internet connectivity across Maine. Thank you. Um, a question from Gail Peters. Uh, she's asking what political actions are being taken to make you internet access a public utility to make it more affordable and accessible. The biggest set of political actions that is, that is happening to make internet a public utility is happening at the local level. Um, things like the Down East Broadband Utility are a great example of Multi, multiple communities coming together to build out publicly owned infrastructure. Islesboro has mentioned um, another community that built a, a publicly owned dark fiber network. Um, Long Island, saw Mark Green here on the call earlier. Um, they're looking at, at doing that this year. Um, number of communities in Maine are doing that. When you get to the state level or you get up to the federal level, the conversation uh, at least Federally, we, we missed that boat back in the 90s um, with some legislation that was that was changed. Um, statewide, it hasn't been a huge part of the conversation, in part just because of how, uh, how much investment is already in the state. I look out the outside of my house here in Camden, and there's three different internet service providers who are running wires down, down in front of my street. Um, doesn't mean that it's a conversation that we shouldn't have collectively, but it's not an easy conversation to, to have. Thanks, Nick. Um, uh, another question is, how does the three ring binder play into this? Is that? I'm, I'm happy to take a stab at that. It's all you, Nick. Uh, so the three I think I even saw Jeff Laterno on the call if we wanted to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if we, if we want the, the, the best answer, we should go to Jeff. Um, three ring binders, the, the major super highway that, that your internet goes on once it, once it leaves your, your house and sort of your local uh, distribution roads, for lack of a better, better terminology. It's a, a major pipeline for for fiber, so again, living Camden, three ring binder runs runs through town. People in Camden, you don't get your service off the three ring binder directly. It goes, it goes out a, a little bit. Um, the so the three ring binder is really important in building out infrastructure because it makes it a lot easier for communities for providers to tap into the big pipeline and and connect to the uh, internet. It's hard to hard to hit the uh, right level of, of technical detail in in answering this, but um, it makes it easier for internet service providers to connect to the internet and to build out their their projects. If we didn't have it and somebody wanted to build a network in Camden, they'd have to figure out how to get the internet from Camden to somewhere else in the state, Portland, Bangor, um, Montreal. Jeff, do you? Uh, I don't know if Jeff is able to jump in on this or if that makes sense, but. 
think he's still there. Um, oh, sorry, uh, I didn't realize I could actually speak. So, dangerous. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Nick, I, I, your your explanation is is right on, right? The three binders really infrastructure uh, that enables communication service providers or ISPs to get the internet connectivity they need so they can then distribute it to the household or to the business. If you don't have that kind of infrastructure, infrastructure passing through your community, the cost to get high speed internet is just so much greater because you have to pay much higher cost to have it backhauled into the community. So it's an, it's, it's an enabler of building out community broadband, be it by the public or by commercial providers. Thing. Thank you. Uh, that was Jeff Letourneau from Network Maine, also a fellow Connect Maine board member and uh, intimately involved in the creation of the Three Binder. Thanks. There's one more question that I might have already answered, but I just thought I'd pose it again. Um, just sorry. Um, Solomon is asking, Spectrum is asking $10,000 to bring internet down the five existing poles to our house. Um, they, our town is in a franchise agreement with Spectrum, talks about sharing for extending cable. Has there been any, any limitation of fairness on what cost sharing means? I can't necessarily speak to the cost sharing, but I can speak to franchise agreements a little bit. So if someone wants to tackle the cost sharing aspect first, I can just speak to clarify a little bit around franchise agreements. Go, go for it. Sure. So um, just to lay a little groundwork for franchise agreements, um, there's a little bit of a misconception around franchise agreements being for entire communities. So every premise within a community gets access if there's a franchise agreement, probably with your local cable company. Um, typically, franchise agreements have premise density standards within them. Um, a lot of these were set back in the 90s or early 2000s. So premise density rates were a lot higher, looking at anywhere between 20 and 30 premises per mile. Um, that's not adequate to connect rural Maine. It's not adequate when you're looking at some of our private roads that have you know, one, two, three houses on them. I mean, we like to live in a rural state because we don't want our neighbors nearby, right? Um, so when it comes to franchise agreements, now we're starting to see numbers closer to 15. There was some legislation passed uh, a, a year or two ago um, that brought that number down. So when communities have the opportunity to revisit their franchise agreements, we always make sure that we always want to make sure that they know some of the changes that have occurred so that they can be advocates for their franchise agreement. Communities don't have a lot of leverage within those to make changes um, outside of legislative uh, changes. So seeing that number kind of come down from, from the 20 range to 15, that still leaves a lot of communities and residents with the situation like we're hearing here. $10,000 to connect a house is, is not uncommon. We've even heard stories of $48,000, $75,000, um, you know, depending on when you call and who you talk to. Um, and then even on top of that, monthly subscription rates that are anywhere between hundreds or even up into the twelve and $1,300 range. Um, and that's to see that return on investment come back in a really short time period, three years, five years. Um, we haven't seen, you know, grant conversations around individual, uh, grant conversations around individual grants to make this more affordable. And that's where a lot of people that are in these situations are the ones that start local broadband committees or talk to their select board about how this is an issue and, and bring it up. Um, when it comes to cost share, because this is private, I haven't seen a lot of conversations around limitations on cost shares. I haven't seen it in within franchise agreements either. Um, you know, I don't know where that goes from here. And so if Nick or Charlie or, or anyone else on the call um, that, you know, feels like they are confident in talking about that, feel free. But that's kind of what I know about franchise agreements and, and offer the opportunity for others to engage.
Nick, are you going to say something? <laughs> I, I was just going to to note that Melinda Kinney from um, Spectrum put her her note in the uh, a note in the chat um, saying if you have questions about Spectrum franchise agreements to to send her a send her a note. Great, thank you. Um, I think you've all seen, but there's been a still a lot of questions about Starlink and keeping up with technology. If anyone wants to just revisit that conversation again um, to help maybe close out the session, that would be great. I'm ha happy to also add here a little bit. We have communities um, uh, along the coast and, and some starting to be inland as well that have had access to Starlink. We've heard really, really good. We've heard not so great. There have been people who've sent their stuff back and there are people who said, I dropped everything else and I love it. You know, I think it's not bad to, I'm going to go against the grain a little bit. It's not bad to have multiple solutions to a problem. We are unique communities. We're unique individuals. There will be some who even 50 years from now, wireless technologies will be the best thing for them. There are others and there are other communities that will prioritize fiber. There are some where they they would need to work with their incumbent and build in and fill the gaps. And that could be with cable, that can be with DSL, that can be with wireless. It's why we really encourage communities when they start this process to look at everything. Look at your incumbents, look at non-incumbents, look at the technologies you have in place now, look at the technologies that are coming down the pike. I will say 5G requires it's small cell, so it requires dense fiber backhaul. Even in the communities that I've seen fiber build out, I haven't necessarily heard the conversations around taking that next step towards 5G or enticing providers to come in and, and bring that service. Um, maybe that'll change in the next five years or 10 years as that becomes a more readily available. So I, I would just say I, I wouldn't wait and wait on Silicon Valley or other technologies to come in and, and save us as a state. So I think that's where these communications and having conversations like this one are really great. But I wouldn't close the door and say that there's only one technology that's going to be best for every single Mainer. But if there's state money, community money, then those entities and federal money then those entities do have a say in where those dollars go. And I think that's where we start to see the conversation go one way or the other, especially when some technologies haven't been proven yet. We're still waiting on Starlink to be proven across, you know, not just the state, but the nation. They did receive some federal dollars to boost up, uh, you know, their satellites, but regulations mean that that rollout is going to take years. And we're starting to see more and more satellites pointed towards some main communities, Swans Island being one of the first, and and it's a community that I work with. That they are actually their broadband committee is meeting right now. Um, you know, they and and they are one of the first that gave feedback of some people love it, some people don't, some people are you know using it and another thing. So I I just wanted to add that of you know it's not one size fits all, but then when we start to talk about money that investment can, can start to shift those conversations. And when there's community-based money that gives the community the power to say, this is what we want. Um, so I'll just- uh, And I, I'll just add to that and say that from you know, our standpoint at AARP, it is about the equity piece. And we do have members who simply said, Starlink sounds great, but I can't afford it. Um, and I would just echo what Kendra Joe was saying is it's early. I mean, this is the sparkly thing that just showed up. There's a lot of attention for good reason, but it's early in the technological life of sort of where this is going to go. So we very much believe what kind of Joe was saying, which is it's going to be a diverse set of solutions that needs to be out there because we have a diverse array of communities that have different needs. Um, and so the more that we can pursue now, I think the wiser will be set up for in the future. But again, the equity piece, we look at this from the standpoint of knowing that almost 30% of Mainers over 65 are living exclusively off of a social security check. Um, so when you're talking about access, you're talking about the affordability piece. Um, and that's only going to become more of an issue uh, as more and more baby boomers and more and more millennials hit that age bracket. Um, so we think from an equity standpoint, um, you know, we can't just rely on one silver bullet solution.
If I could just jump in, I want to go back to something that we've talked about, but it's coming up again and again through the questions and we've touched on it in lots of different ways. You know, Charlie, as you said, companies need to make a return on investment, but we've got different providers. People have different levels of satisfaction with those providers. We have a patchwork system. Some communities are going gung-ho. Some don't even know where to start. And Japheth, as you say, you know, this is such an essential service for everybody. Is there any conversation at the federal level or elsewhere that we need a better way to do this, that we need this to be like our power grid, like water, like sewer, that everybody needs this. So we can't have people being charged $10,000 to connect and other people, you know, they're lucky because their community's picking up the tap. What's the thinking about a more coherent way to do this? Is that uh, falling, falling back towards me again? I, I think so. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think there's sort of two two parts to that answer and and the how do we get a more coherent way to do this? We need better information, we need better data, we need a better understanding of where the broadband challenges are and how we're going to go about fixing them. And so some of that is in the speed test mapping that the main broadband coalition is doing. Um, a lot of that is in the work that's happening locally at, at towns with the broadband planning work. All of that starts laddering up to the Connect Main Authority, to broadband providers. We've seen in the last couple of months that Consolidated and Unitel have both made significant investments um, or said they'll make significant investments in expanding broadband infrastructure in the state and improving their infrastructure. Um, that's great news. We need more private sector providers doing that. I think Spectrum made an announcement a couple of months ago saying something similar. Um, you know, this is this is great news. We have private the private sector putting money into helping to solve solve these problems. Uh, Bill Varney and, and Don Fulling, you're both on my screen right now. You're you're both part of companies that are making investments in in rural Maine. It's it's how do we, as a state, start to help these investments happen? How do we make them go a little bit further? How do we help these companies connect the next road or make sure that they're leaving a, a couple of loops of fiber at a corner so they can come back and, and connect people who live down that road? Um, it's the communities like Long Island who said, you know what, we need to solve this problem for, for ourselves. We're going to vote and we're going to um, back a municipally funded network. Um, we're going to fund this network and we're going to work with a provider to light it and make sure that the debt's paid off. That's, that's where we are in Maine and that's where the innovation is happening. Again, it all comes back to state money, state resources to be a partner and for the state to start defining what, what it needs out of the partnership beyond just let's connect a few more people. Let's talk about what do we need for economic value? Let's talk about what we need for affordability. Let's talk about what we need to be getting as a partner in a public-private partnership. Can I just say real quickly also on the funding piece, because I know it's a question that's popping up in chat. Um, you know, Maine has passed, I think, close to 10 transportation bonds in the last 13 years for over $980 million. And I can say that I spend far more time on the information superhighway than on Highway 95. And I think most of you can probably say the same. And so if we're looking at comparing where the funding's coming from and how those dollars are votes for support, they're community votes of support um, for a collective goal, um, we have a lot of work to go, which is why Kendra Joe was saying, you know, 15 million is great. It's a, it's a vote of confidence to say we want to do this. But we have a long road ahead of us, you know, in terms of the funding mechanism, um, when you compare it to where else we are putting state dollars or state votes. That's great. Does anyone else want to speak on this topic specifically? If not, I just, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, I would. I would just add. Also, is you know, 
15 minutes, 15 minutes, ooh, 15 million is also a, a way for us to prove that we can really make use of those dollars. Connect Maine Authority hasn't been given that chance before, and the communities in Maine haven't been given that chance before, and voters were able to say, yes, this is a priority, this is a problem, and we need to make an investment, and, you know, there are some people you know, that I come across that say 15 million wasn't nearly enough and there are others that feel like it was too much. And so we're going to see how far $15 million can go and it's not gonna stop there. You know, We do hope that we'll, we'll see more money coming from the state. When it comes to you know, thinking about this the same way we think about electricity or as a utility, it's incredible to see how powerful those conversations are at the community level and making faster change, but from what I've seen, the community level moves a lot faster than the federal level. And Mainers won't wait. People are tired of waiting for, um, for the service that's adequate for them, for any service at all, you know, for that matter, for many in, in Maine. So I think that's what we've seen and why we're starting to have, why we've been having conversations at community levels, and now we're having it at the state level in a more serious manner and seeing 75% of Mainers voting yes on the bond in July just showed that this is a priority for a vast majority of the state and we're willing to put the dollars into this and make the investment um, because we can't wait on the federal government and an administration that prioritizes internet connectivity um, like we might have seen you know, earlier in the 1900s when it came to, when it came to electrification, right? So I, I love that, I love Connect, you know, comparing the two and it's such a powerful message, especially when you're talking about the value of it. It's moved projects forward and it's gotten so many people on board because they do start to see as a, a necessity as a utility, no longer as a luxury in life. And for those that, you know, didn't always feel like the internet was that vital to their day-to-day, -day, I think in the last year and a half, if it's not a vital to your personal day-to-day, -day, it's vital to the people in your life or the resources that you rely on or the community that you live in. And so it does become more vital. And that's been really incredible as well. So I, I've been loving the chat and, and everything, but it's amazing to see that communities are taking action. The state is starting to step up as well. And hopefully the federal government will start to step forward in the future as well, but we can't always wait for that. There was a concern just posed that possibly larger communities such as Portland um, that are a little bit better organized and better funded would receive more funding than other areas with less resources. Does anybody want to speak to that concern? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's pretty clear, at least on the Connect Main side of things, that the funding goes to those places that are currently unserved. So if your internet connection isn't as good as what I had in Falmouth in the late 90s, that's where state funding goes right now. And that's the, you know, that's not Portland, that's not Falmouth. There are, um, it's more rural Maine, it's those places where it's less economical to make those investments and it's you know that's that's where the money's going this money's going to rural rural parts of the state rural parts of the you know i live in camden it, it might go to rural parts of camden um really it's probably more likely going towards places further west of camden between camden and augusta um where the population density really starts to drop off or western waldo county or franklin county or places where um nobody's going to look at those communities and go, oh yeah, that's a big community. They've got a lot of resources. Anybody else want to say anything on that? I'll, I'll just jump in and say, it's again, back to equity for us. We don't want this to have to come down to luck of the draw where you live in, in the community that has access to this and has the resources or organizations to back it. Um, and so there, I, you know, the way that we're looking at this is often about, you know, there's some very big positive signs from more of a piecemeal local grassroots effort, but as was acknowledged by Charlie early on, it's slow. It is slow and hard. You are, you are taking each step one year at a time. Um, and there is evidence to show that when there's a more collective effort that is comprehensive, there are different challenges with that, but it will probably be faster uh, in some ways. 
Um, and so we're trying to weigh, you know, the, the benefits of both, um, knowing that each community is diverse and different and has different needs, um, but also being aware that, uh, you know, we don't want to end up leaving certain communities behind that have residents who need those connections. Thank you. Um, we're getting towards the end of the event here. Does anyone have any final last words or anything that they'd like to say before we start to wrap up? Take the main broadband coalition speed test. <laughs> and if you don't have access, this is, I failed to mention this earlier and I apologize, but if you don't have access at your home, you can still log in from a library, your cell phone, any other device. And there's a button that you can click that to put in your address for no service. So it, I think it says, you know, no service applicable or some, or along those lines, you click that button and then you um, go in and you put your address and what you'll appear on the map is as a black dot. And that tells us that there is you no know, service present at that address. So with or without service, please take the, the speed test. It'll be up until September, take it often. Try not to take it during a Zoom meeting. Um, or when people are watching Netflix in the background, but please, please take it, um, encourage others to take it and just share it so we can collect the data. I mean, that's what we're really looking to collect the data and your communities are looking at it, your state's looking at it. So that's my final word. Thank you all for joining us. I'll, uh, I'll jump in and say the same, take the speed test. Uh, we are part of the main broadband coalition as well here at AARP and um, have been telling our members to do so. Um, often. Um, I'll also ask folks to contact their state legislators to see where they stand on broadband. Uh, for the first time, we've got a, a broadband caucus inside the state legislature um, who is really advocating and pushing a conversation about how we get to uh, a more connected Maine. And so if your state legislator is not involved in that broadband caucus, I would urge you to make a call or email uh, and tell them to, to sit in because there's gonna be a lot of education that goes along uh, what current bills that do with, deal with broadband are being put forward um, and building support for how we can be more connected. So there is a uh, grassroots advocacy piece of this that everyone on the call can definitely add to. Um, and as a reminder as well, I will be sending around that speed test link to everyone that participated and registered tonight. So you will get an email with that speed test link just in case you missed it. Um, Susan, did you have anything else you wanted to say or anyone else? No, if I just wanna thank our panel for participating and answering a lot of questions, covered a lot of ground, a lot more conversation. I think Alyssa, you'll tell us quickly about the upcoming meetings. So we hope people will join us again in the future. Yes, absolutely. Thank you to all the panelists. You guys were great. And we do have three more topics, three more events coming up on broadband in Maine, um, discussing topics of, of around broadband in Maine. The next event is next Wednesday, um, February 24th at 5 p.m. We will be discussing um, data privacy and security and accessibility. Then in March, we will have a discussion around um, broadband's impact on education in Maine. And our final event in April will be surrounding what are connectivity options available, what connectivity options are available for Mainers. So please join us for the um, other three events that we'll be having. And again, I will be sending you guys an email with the registration and information for those events. Well, great. Thank you again to all of our amazing panelists. Thank you guys so much. We really appreciate it. This was, this was great. And if you guys have any questions, you can email me at events at thebangordailynews.com. And we hope to see you at some of our future events. Thank you, everyone. Good night. <laughs>